as many of you probably know, David Weigel has covered uh, the US politics uh, from grassroots movements up to presidential campaigns, contributing to many top tier publications, including over many years his current home at the Washington Post. But far more important than any of that political stuff, he knows how to track down great Rick Wakeman quotes. His new book, This Show That Never Ends, has its fair share of great Wakeman quotes and Emerson quotes and Fripp quotes. As a history of progressive rock, it captures the evolving personalities behind a genre that feels in many ways fixed in time, a 70s heyday that somehow mixed ambitious time signatures and often science fiction conceits with high record sales and great crowds turning up. And then what happened? So. Joining David to talk about that will be his former co-worker at Slate, one-time editor of our town's own Washington City paper, and now the senior prog rock correspondent at Politico, Jack Schaefer. <laughs> so with that, I'll leave it to them. Great. He's Weigel. I'm Schaefer. <laughs> um, I'm so delighted uh, to be here and, and uh, interviewing Dave. Um, what a lot of people don't know is um, uh, being the opening act tonight, um, it wasn't always that way. I used to be a star. <laughs> Dave would open for me. <laughs> and then as happens so often in show business, my career kind of went in the toilet. His has gone higher and higher. Now I've been going around the country opening for Dave, but he's been very good. He lets, lets me ride in a sort of trailer that's pulled behind his luxury <laughs> bus. Um, so, so my many thanks to him. He's a real mensch. Um, I was thinking how much I, I was admired him and, and, and was happy to moderate this. And then I realized his real motive for having me ask him questions. First, I realized he was too lazy to write his own sort of talk. So if he could get somebody else to sort of put the ball up there for to, to spike, uh, it'd be easier. And the second one is that, and I think the real motive was, he needed somebody who was old enough to answer the question, Tell me what it was like to see the prog rock bands live in their pi prime, Grandpa. <laughs> well, I'm not a grandpa, but um, it is true. Um, I'm old enough to be one. And for about 18 months in the very early 70s, before I came to my senses, I was a huge prog rock fan. Um, I saw ELP and Yes on their first US tour on a double bill at uh, Detroit's East Town Theater. I saw King Crimson three weeks later at the Fountain Street Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, my most distinct recollection of that show, which was a very great one, was an anecdote that Fripp um, shared and is not in the book. I gave it to Dave, but he decided not to use it. Um, the band had been signed to Ireland in, in the UK, but in the US, uh, it was Atlantic that picked them up. And Atlantic was traditionally an R&B label and had been moving in the rock direction for the four or five years, but it was still sort of an R&B-ish uh, uh, label. And Fripp, uh, when, when he performed he, uh, between uh, tracks he, or uh, songs, he told us that uh, his story of having uh, met the uh, At Atlantic Record exec executives for the first time, they came into the studio, um, they welcomed the band, and one of the really more square of the executives uh, approached the band in all earnestness and said, welcome, welcome. OK, which one of you is the king? <laughs> So before we go any further, I just want to get a round of applause for the new king of prog rock, Dave Weigel. Um, Dave, I thought we would go to the essence of prog rock um, sure. with a really tough question um, in the beginning. Um, Mellotron or Moog and why? <laughs> it's, I would go with the Mellotron because I have very limited technical skills, despite writing the whole book about this and learning more music theory in order to r write the book. And Mellotron is such a s very relatively simple instrument. It's hard not to, if you know chords, hard not to sound good on it. Moog, insanely complicated. I'd probably just end up sounding like the like at the end of a of a blazed out solo every time I tried to play any melody on it. I played a theremin once, and that, that doesn't count because it's not in this music at all. Very, very difficult to make anything that sounds melodic on it. So for Prague, do you think that the Mellotron is more the essence of the music, and is it is it because mm. it's a more romantic or or less spacey, freaky um, instrument? Because you know, yeah. to to me, I I I'm with you. And Mellotron, though the Moog is very important. Mm -hmm. It's it's like the that 
that kind of uh, prog rock wall of sound is not possible without the mm -hmm. Mellotron. No, that's that's kind of the point. Mellotron came about first. It's a very simple synthesizer. It's most I guess most people will hear Strawberry Fields Forever. I know I know what Mellotron is. Uh, in progressive rock, it's used around the same time in a much bigger and darker way. I mean, the the the, the hook of King, Crim King, King, King Crim Crimson's first songs where they were kind of approximating the sound of big classical music. That was the Mellotron. The Mo comes just a little bit later, and it's, it's Keith Emerson who used it first to make wild sounds that jar with the music. And I think it's, it ends up being more important because that level of experimentation in progressive rock ends up being, I think, why it's more relevant, why it's more influential to give credit for than, than the early stuff where, you know, Procol Harum bringing in uh, Bach and... Uh, Yes, cover, the, the covers the bands were doing of, of the classical stuff. Once they bring in the really out there influences that have never been in music before, that's when I think they deserve the credit. Now, there's a throwaway, throwaway in the book. <clears throat> yeah. You say that Princess Margaret had a Mellotron? Yeah. And why? It was the fashion at the time. It was like, it was the like rich thing. people had Mellotrons? That's, well, once you, once you have, have everything. Although, I think that was after she'd already been denied marriage to her, her first love. So after that, she got the Mellotron. The natural, the natural rebound. Now, yeah. did, did she did she play it? Did she record, or did she just I, was it just in the sitting room or something? I wish I had bootleg recordings of that, but no, it was just it was it was. Th this is kind of <laughs> this is kind of relevant to it because it was so fashionable in a way that has been forgotten. It, this was this was the new radical music, the way that we all remember punk blowing this up was radical. This was radical in the same way. So what what better way to to, to show your freak flag than to buy this thing that approximated uh, gooey kind of orchestra sounds by playing little tape loops. I was really tempted to, when I read this, I was tempted to go through my record collection to see if I could find a credit for her on any of these classic <laughs> record, you know, Mellotron, track seven, Princess Margaret. Would have been great. Um, or it might, might go under a pseudonym, like something, something similar like M. Windsor. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the your book is a sort of narr they're, they're, it's a narrative history. You follow time zero, um, so I thought it would for those who haven't read the book. When when do you think the that Prague comes together mm -hmm. identifiably? I mean, if you were to if you were if if, if you were the archaeologist going back and and looking for the mankind's earliest expression mm -hmm. of of not just a track, not just you know twelve bars, but the, the first um, record that we can say that's prog rock and and it's prog rock in the way that nothing was before or after. Uh, well, I, uh, that's a good way to put it because it's I start some of the narrative with uh, Procol Harum and Whiter Shed a Pale, which is a pop song, which it just incorporates uh, via the Hammond organ. This this Bach and this basically rips off Bach. And, and blends with the, mel with the melody of what had been a pretty mediocre rock song. And I didn't really get into it in the book. There's a whole lawsuit later of <laughs> the members of the band who wrote the rest of the song, uh, angry that, the, that uh, the, the organist is taking credit for it, the one thing people remember about it. Uh, when it comes to the actual definition the press was giving, and the press is really big in the book. I think that's partly personal bias. It's what I do for a living. I think it's also relevant because this... The shape of this music was defined by critics, and then it was blown up by critics. Uh, they start calling it progressive, really, in 67, 68. The Who get defined as progressive. Pete Townsend then takes a role in promoting King Crimson and giving it that label. And labels like Harvest and You Mentioned Island start advertising progressive rock. Uh, radio stations in the United States have progressive rock, uh, have progressive rock channels. So... The, lots of ba bands then start identifying in that way because people kind of know what they're getting. They're going to get worldly mystical rock with with influences that you didn't get before something something long experimental not there are the the longs multi-part suites in a lot of these music that's that's not necessarily required but yeah king crimson's first album in the core of the crimson king that's when when it it's progressive rock separate from a band that had just you know gone from beat to maybe making a concept album that's when it becomes more distinct so that's 69 that's 69 yeah so the we we can see the roots 67, 68, and it's, of course, it's more than just lifting classical music influences because right. pop music uh, composers have been doing that for the longest time mm -hmm. and, and playing organs in a church. They you steal the questions. Oh, I'm not. That's like, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's not allowed. When, when there's a piece of paper, it's my, my instinct to look down. 
<laughs> See what's revealed on it. Goddamn reporter. If I, um, we did this one day earlier, I could have made like a Senate health care bill joke and lost the room. <laughs> but uh, it's, out, it's out already. It's not or too late. Or won the room. I don't know. It's not too late. Um, so, uh, so you haven't plugged the Beatles yet. Can, you, can we yeah. talk about a couple of tracks or a, a couple of gestures by the Beatles being sort of prog rock? Because in the book, mm -hmm. people, in your book, people keep on harking back to the Beatles and mm -hmm. saying, we want to we want to be ambitious like the Beatles. We want to, like on Sgt. Pepper's, there's, there, there are all these kinds of, you know, old folk music, uh, English folk music mm -hmm. traditions, which is a big part of the a prog rock thing. Yeah. So talk, talk a little bit about the Beatles. Well, th these bands are just, actually, some are the same age as the Beatles, some are a couple years younger, but they, they listen to the Beatles on their way up. I mean, a lot of these bands start playing Motown, the, the, the bands I'm talking about being, uh, Members of Yes, members of Genesis, Genesis members of Jethro Tull, uh, the Moody Blues especially, they'll, they'll start more playing kind of uh, less inspired cover, cover, cover band sort of music and are listening to the Beatles. So when the Beatles swing into what they're doing on Sgt. Pepper uh, and concept albums that the experiments with sound, it becomes, they definitely, they start trends that uh, the thing they don't do is because they're not really playing live at that point is the live psychedelic being side of music and that's what I think really shapes progressive rock in the, in the early days. A lot of the bands I write, I write about these all night concerts uh, bands like the Soft Machine that go in a strong jazz fusion direction um, bands like Pink Floyd that end up becoming a bit more mainstream uh, that's the difference. They're taking the, those influences, but they're also kind of expanding it live, and that changes the music in the way the Beatles at that point, I mean, apart from the concert on the top of the roof or Get Back, they're not really doing that anymore. So I lived through this era, and I survived it, and, and I despise it. <laughs> but The era or the? Yeah, the, the okay, whole good. rock era. I mean, it's, it's rubbish. Um, <laughs> but but w one of the things that you're uh, piped down, <laughs> um, one of the uh, you always have to deal with a heckler, and my heckler is out of my line of vision over here. Um, is that is I hadn't thought about this before I read your book. How much it's if if you I don't know if you hit um, psychedelic music on the side of the head with a hammer, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a, a blurt of a gout of blood and mm -hmm. and prog rock comes out the other side. And I yeah. never really made I mean Not you, how I Dave, it, yeah. Dave talks about. <laughs> Dave talks about at one time, um, Jimi Hendrix is talking about collaborating with ELP, yeah. right? Which, which you know, if you look at it from the orthodox, you know, rock history view, that would be preposterous because mm -hmm. there was nothing progressive rock about the psychedelia of, of Jimi Hendrix. But he didn't think so no. at the time. I, I mean, they they were his soul brothers. Yeah, and Keith Emerson is is covered in, and seen by fans the same way that, that Hendrix is, except for the organ. He is throwing an organ around the stage. He's sticking knives in it to suppress the keys down. He's as flamboyant as Hendrix is, and he's as good at, at his respective instrument as he is. I mean, the, the, the solos he's doing in the middle of these shows, he starts as the backing for a, a soul singer, P.P. Arnold, and just and Hendrix is starting <laughs> as a sideman, too. And so, they, yeah, they're, they're rising in tandem. It's, it's really only <laughs> when it all collapses in the late 1970s that people start segregating the, what was cool about the late 60s to, and this. But no, they were very intertwined uh, in, in, the, in the late 60s when a lot of the book starts. Um, most popular music, uh, blues, R&B, rock, metal, rap, um, deals with carnality. Mm -hmm. and, um, but there's something profoundly unsexy yeah. about prog rock. And w like, were these guys denutted? <laughs> uh, no, the was there, so, I mean, were they were they all John Anderson and and seeking to reach a higher plane, or because th yeah. that's you know I went back and listened to some of this stuff, and you know I'm, I'm you know I'm thinking maybe I missed it the first time. Yeah, some of it's not. I mean, King Crimson have, have two songs that are basically about about roadies and the uh, interview, and there's stuff in the book too about Greg Lake, especially Greg Lake is a classic rock frontman. Uh, getting every girl he wants, introducing bandmates, they're taking the girls that they want. And uh, John Anderson's kind of, a, there are people like John Anderson and then David Allen from Gong, who are so much in their own universe, they care less uh, about that kind of thing. That's that's true. Uh, they're, some of them, they become family men pretty early, which is not uncommon. The Beatles all got married pretty early. Uh, there is less, I think, ribaldry. And, there, I mean, there's some Rolex smashing and some cocaine and what have you in the book. 
but generally, uh, early on, late, late 60s, when they're, when they're touring, there's some of that. Uh, they get the more of the debauchery is more kind of drinking focused for the rest of the period. And yeah, and it doesn't always show up in the music. And now, the, you, you talk about this the lyrics, in your book someplace say. where they're, you know, like Heineken is the drug of choice yeah. for a lot of these bands. I mean, they're banging back pints rather than. Mm-hmm. Than smoking a lot of dope or yes, is you know draining the liquor cabinet each leg of an international flight and that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. So they they they, they were rock stars. <laughs> like the idea that they were those they were kind of ossified and writing nerd, uh, writing music that you could only enjoy in the comfort of your home. Totally untrue. They're playing gigantic arenas. They're kind of inventing arena rock as we know it. I mean, the, the Stones are doing it at the same time, but a lot of the the full arena filling sound effects. That's ELP. Do that first. Um. I don't know if anybody else cares about about this question, but I do. How did a very sensible man like you come to write this book? <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you've got you've got pretty good taste, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and your interests. Uh, I share many of your interests. Yeah, and um, you know, except for that one eighteen month period of my insanity when I, I was really into this music, um, and so I thought that I could I could learn something about my temporary insanity by learning more about like. You know, this, this is not your permanent insanity. Yeah. This is this is not a lark. You've gone back, and you've resurrected and brought honor, mm-hmm. uh, I dare say, to uh, you know something that I thought was rubbish. Yeah. Um, so t- t- tell tell us about how I know I know the the origin myth that you this started as a big project for Slate. It was very successful. Everybody liked it. But what possessed you? Mm-hmm to go back. Is this something you thought about doing for a long time? I did. I wanted to be a music writer before I wanted to be a political journalist. The first the first stuff I wrote was on the internet uh, back when it was uh, kinder than it is now. It's still not kind, but more more focused on the, the, collector col- the collector culture is pretty easy to jump into, and I liked heavy metal as a kid and found reviews. That Mark Prindle, who I thank in the book, this I- independent critic just with a website he'd update on HTML, reviewing stuff he liked metal and i went nod my head at that and then he liked yes too and i uh went to buy yes tapes i think i found i found them at an outlet store where they were heavily discounted uh and uh, and cassette tapes too if uh, anyone remembers them well they're kind of back right they're coming back uh the art on on these particular cassette tapes was shrunk down to about old ipod size so, which is exactly the way you're supposed to see Roger Dean paintings of, of planets. It's with none of the none of the interior notes and just a tiny postage. And even then, I, I, I liked it. And I remember listening to Fragile first and hearing Roundabout, uh, harmonic, and then the classical guitar, and then the whole thing coming in and realizing, oh, ba- every metal band's ripped this off. <laughs> I didn't know where'd this come from. How much of this is there? So I liked that was when I was, I want to say, 15, and I just kept it up from there. And I. I looked around to see if anyone had done a good book about this the way there is about basically every genre at this point. I mean, while I was writing this, the, the Krot Rock book finally came out. Uh, not by me. A very good book called Future Days. And I, I, I just said, this is as, not only is it is interesting, but it filled this giant piece missing between what is seen as good rock and what's seen as punk. And we, we, get, we start punk with the, well, at least they blew up Prague. Okay. <laughs> what do they blow up? How do you understand it without seeing why they blew it, blew it up? Um, perhaps one of the reasons that I turned um, so viciously against uh, prog rock is there was a huge cultural um, a critic, critical backlash against prog rock. As Dave points out in the book, when prog first arrives, when ELP and Yes come out, all the, all the mainstream critic, critics, uh, Rolling Stone, are raving about the ambition and the, the breadth of the musical knowledge and the musicianship and you know even taking a nod at the at the lyrics um, and so I think my infatuation probably coincided with the time when the cultural turn came yeah just as these guys started to fill arenas and their sort of massive uh, artistic statements started to get a little bloated mm-hmm. then then the 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 critical backlash was withering yeah. and and you've gone back and read all the old rolling stones and nmes and and uh, uh creams and and maybe you could t- tell us a little bit about like how important mm-hmm. um uh, the rock cr- critics were in the development and mm-hmm. then the burying of of prog rock oh they're important in a way though uh that no critic probably ever will be again and it may not wistful is not the right word it made me feel 
Uh, I, I finally appreciated the conspiracy theory people have about the political press that we all meet in a room somewhere and come up with a storyline and decide to share and decide to go with it because it feels like that happens in the late seventies and to the extent where even magazines are changing their design their font to be a more punk font with like that looks like graffiti instead of instead of normal typeface for these fans. No, they turn faster than the fans do. Uh, the, the they the, I know it's in two thousand nineteen seventy seven seventy eight. The end of year polls, which are all fan selected, they still say their favorite keyboard players, Keith, um, Keith Emerson or Rick Wakeman. They still say the favorite guitarist is Steve Howe. But the critics, they're lo- some of them are younger people replacing the old ones. Some of them are just old ones that got sick of this. Uh, and they, they, they turn hard because it's not cool anymore. And the record labels also stop promoting it the same way and sign punk. I mean, Virgin, which, has, which broke big, which became what it is basically because of tubular bells, uh, then moves off that entirely and it's still there <laughs> like the other funny thing about it I, I continue into the rise of Marillion and, and these the second wave of progressive bands and and it's also withering but it's confused because the critics think that they they killed it but it wasn't it, it, it's only conspiracy and that everyone has the same <laughs> everyone has the same view at the same time and I, I I'll give it credit in the so far the music is worse I mean ELP do not defend the quality of Love Beach compared to the other albums they're making and yes can't stand Tormato and some of that is you know, it's a little there's a little chicken and egg and how much of it is being told that this work you produced is garbage for 30 years how much does that influence you but um, it's a it's a, just a clash of perfect things the perfect uh, per- perfect biases i guess come at the same time the critics and the producers and the radio programmers all decide oh, okay we're done and the musicians say well you know just hit 30 we're kind of done with this too um do you think there would you single out a single critic for being um responsible for for plowing the sea and getting <laughs> other critics to fall in line because i remember yeah, lester, lester bang-, bang i was about to say lester bangs who really uh, writes that story. Does everybody know who Lester Bangs is? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good nodding. They're like bo- <laughs> there's like bobbleheads out there. Wise men still seek him. <laughs> no, he's him, and then basically the entirety of of, of sounds because they are they start as a sort of progressive. I almost might say lowercase p, but of course all this is lowercase p. Progressive lowercase p band. We're looking for the stuff. British rock is defined as the amazing experimental music we're exporting to the rest of the world. You know that when. When e- ELP signed their label, Italian progressive rock bands a huge triumph. When Yes come over, the, or sorry, when Rush come over, uh, they are faded and studied. So they, yeah, they 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 all turned at the same time. <laughs> I just really didn't find a critic who kept the the light going. And the ones who did, like Chris Welch, who uh, who ends up being a biographer for Yes, just, just kind of holding the torch, but just not writing for them as much anymore. He gets supplanted. Um, I've got I've been hogging Dave, so I'm going to ask him one more question. We'll have about a good healthy half hour maybe longer for for your questions because um because many of you probably like this music a lot more than Just i do the length of todd rungren's treatise on chris uh yeah, yeah exactly the the, the, the <laughs> uh, fire uh, yeah um cosmic fire sorry. now we haven't talked much about robert fripp robert fripp is the 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 godfather of of king crimson and he goes away and he comes back and he's wildly influential and and uh is a great artist a great influence and it seemed to me that that one way to read your book is a biography of Robert Fripp mm-hmm. because um, he's he's threaded throughout the entire book. He's always there. He's never gone away. He's doing a tour this summer, right? Or right now? Doing right now. I think he's yeah. just on the West Coast. And yeah. and and so it's clear that you know that I sense even in you there's a um, as you're following the arc of the, these bands, there's a sort of you've got a rising disgust for some of them, mm-hmm. and you're saying, "Jesus Christ, put a stake in it." You know, you're, you're really <laughs> sick of them. But not disgust. There are some people whose egos don't really match what they're writing, and that he's not one of them, though. But but you remain smitten yeah. by Fripp in a way that I don't think there, there's any other other figure in the book. Mm-hmm. So I wanted you to talk about about Fripp, his influence, um, and and you know why you hold him in such High regard and why? Why you know the, what? We're fifty years on. Um, mm-hmm. Why he's still so influential in in uh, music? Well, Not just prog music, but yeah. all music. Well, I think he's one of the actual geniuses who comes out of out of the movement, uh, and also hates the idea that it's a movement. He rejects the term. He hates the term prog. Some of the people do. Uh, he he doesn't even love the term progressive. He writes experimental music. He and he I think he comes across so well because. 
he just gets bored easily with what they've done before, even when they reinterpret it like he does now. He well, he he is now touring with a three drummer version of the band, which he'd never four. existed. Four, it's four, yeah, it's four in the new tour. Three when I saw them last year, um, and he wants it to the way he puts is fresh whenever it was written. Uh, and I and he part of it I think natu- he naturally winds himself into so many more stories because after he he bre- he breaks up King Crimson the first time when they could keep they easily could keep going. It's this this probably the 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 strongest iteration of the band as a progressive rock band with him and him, him Br- Br- Bill Bruford and John Wetton then he just doesn't like it anymore quits goes into seclusion <laughs> comes back and is playing a completely different style based on just reor- reorienting his mental states and, and what what comes across in the book is that he is just never comfortable in a way that I think uh, that that hones genius when you are never you were never truly he's happy with what he produces from time to time it's not it's not that it's not that but he's He's, he is always worried that he's going to fall into a, a pose. And so he ends up writing, well, well, collaborating with Brian Eno on completely ambient and experimental music. He ends up collaborating with David Bowie on this pop song that everyone can hear in their head. They, th- they hear one note of it. Uh, and then the 80s transforms again. <laughs> and also pulls musicians up, and like Adrian Ballou, uh, where I think he just pollinates, but he doesn't pollinate it with progressive rock. He pollinates with this, everyone I talk to has this, respect for him that I have not encountered <laughs> anyone I've covered in politics well, talk, talk. Where they cannot they often talk about the fear of working with him and him looking across the stage at you when he when you know well, you're not sure what you did but you played something he didn't like and then they but they never regret it they're like he just makes everything so better talk a little bit about his collaboration with uh, Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates oh, yeah. a, a record <laughs> a record a record a record is that is more talked about than listened to yeah sacred um, songs and and so just talk about this is this is not the mashup. Mm-hmm. This this is not the matching of artists you you expect. But no. what he the triumph he comes away with that he but he basically he's after well he's never a vocalist he's only a guitarist and he teams up with vocalists he adopts Hall for a period uh, when he's living in New York and then in the late nineteen seventies uh, album do, album doesn't get released by the label even though it's very good and immediately he runs to the press to trash <laughs> Daryl Hall and blame him for why this happened. Decades later, Daryl Hall is, not, is unhappy about this. Uh, but he, when you hear Hall, you think Hall and Oates, you hear a certain sound, uh, Robert Fripp hears that voice and is playing like fluttering kind of water melodies with, a, with this guitar or playing extremely quick riff rock, like, uh, like you, you burn me up on a cigarette, just, uh, it, not in a Brian Brian Wilson way where he's pop, pop symphonies all the time. He just knows a sort of music that is not obvious, and and for the voice that he's playing with or for the instruments he's playing with, and he knows the guitar part uh, to use with it. And I, I talked to the Roches too because he produces their their first album, and they just described him knowing exactly. Uh, Hearing hearing something the first time and knowing exactly what guitar part to sync it up with, uh, and then often very staying away with the guitar parts, but finding s- something in this you know, acoustic band sound they didn't have after that. So, yeah, he comes across very well in the book, despite everyone who he worked with having a story about him being really cruel to them, <laughs> including at his guitar camp where. You basically live in a uh, modified cult situation and unlearn everything you learned about guitar and relearn it in the Robert Fripp sense, which is all about discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's the, he's the guy that I can still admire and listen to. Um, yeah. We're at the half hour mark, and um, I think uh, we're probably ready for some, yeah, there's some questions. The, there's the a mic microphone. There. Put a mic in your hand and kick out the jams. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> first we first we have to know your last name. What's your last name? Uh, first go. Fursco? Yeah. Okay. Weigel, Schaefer, and Fursco, a prog rock group. Yeah. Can, can, you drum, can you drum? Yeah. Because I'm going to be the, Dave's going to be the keyboard player. I'm going to be the singing bassist. <laughs> anyway, there'll, there'll be auditions after the show. After, so uh, take it away. Auditions for, for what? For the, for the super for group the that we're going to perform, group. yeah. All right. Uh, uh, I was wondering, um, because I always got the impression that when MTV came along in 1981, it sort of leveled all the big, like, late 70s acts, uh, just sort of not being able to make the music video transition. Do you think uh, MTV played a large role in prog rock kind of being on the wane, or do you think it was already heavily on the wane before that? Uh, it's, It's almost the opposite. Well, it had been on the wane before that. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, it's almost the opposite, because 
unexpectedly, several of these bands whose members were in their mid-30s by that point uh, are pushed by their labels into forming what they admit for immediately are corporate rock bands like like Asia. Uh, yes, it's reconstituted with Trevor Rabin just because the studio thinks they sound good together. A couple years later, Emerson, Lake and, Emerson and Lake uh, realize that you, all you need is a P. So they add <laughs> Cozy Powell and they create another ELP to make the band work. And uh, Asia are just promoted uh, to hell and back by MTV in a way that even sure. surprises them. I you know talked to Wet, who's, who's passed away, unfortunately, since. And Lake has passed away. Uh, but no, MTV goes all in on a, on a concert special co- uh, played in Japan and, and called cleverly Asia in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> and... and, and um, People who worked at MTV at the time were like, "Why? Why would? Why do we do that? Why did we put these like bands there?" So well, the Buggles too. I mean, the Buggles were renegade members of Yes, uh, only for this one tour and this one album. The Buggles launch MTV. So actually, uh, I think because of the uh, looking at that and, and seeing seeing how this worked, I think some, the age of some of the executives gave a boost to these guys, like a, for a little while. Genesis too. Genesis already turning into a pop band. Uh, so. The crash really comes when punk comes in, but these ba- the bands that stick it out, I mean, Gentle Giant breaks up just too early for this to really benefit, because they go pop, too. But no, a lot of them get a second wind, because NTV will play their new synth uh, you know, shorter pop song music, being Peter Gabriel. I mean, a lot of the guys who, I, once I was mentioning the book, I, people recognized. They recognized them because they had second wins on MTV. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Four very quick questions. Okay. One word. Donald Trump is in a prog rock band. Oh. What instrument does he play? <laughs> oh, God. I was wondering what the DC he would question would be. He would yodel like the guy in Focus? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, there you go. There you he go. Would, okay, perfect. He would, he'd perfect. be the Peter Sinfield. He'd be worth the, the light show and he'd, he'd yell out lyrics, yeah. Oh, okay, a second quick question. Do you really play keyboard, Dave? No, I, I play guitar, and I had, actually had people kind of reteach me music theory and teach me music theory I did not know. Uh, and I think that th- there are different kinds of music fans. The British right. have a term we use more than Americans, Anorak, where there are fans who just live through the, <laughs> the, the talented musicians versus fans who are musically inclined. A thing I liked about writing the book and research, researching it was meeting these fans who could play every note because right. they're obsessed with music, and I'm not one of them. Right. But I learned a lot, and I kind of, as I was getting the research together, learned a lot also almost by crowdsourcing their view of what was important. Like so, so some stuff that was a little bit cliche I left out and some stuff that they introduced me to got in and got researched. Thirdly, uh, mom, mom, what kind of grade would you give your son? Right <laughs> oh, A plus. A plus, Excellent. okay. And then the serious question, okay. You're an expert in this by studying it. And yeah. I also saw the uh, Yes ELP tour and then Fragile uh, when they came out with Roundabout. It was, I mean, ELP didn't really even want to come out at that yeah. point. And that was it for me. That, not that I liked them. That's just it. That was a high point. For but two things I wonder about, about prog rock. This is good. I like this four-part question with one part that's two parts. Well, <laughs> I was a reporter, it's, okay? It's, it's also, can, no, it's very on brand. What, 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 what can I tell you? We'll see if you're as good answering questions as this you're, you're a good writer. This is total followed. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Very quickly. Two things possibly your thought on it. Prog yeah. rock, you can't dance to it, so it really didn't attract that many women. Yeah. And secondly, sort of like Awesome Con this week, it's a very niche kind of thing, mm-hmm. yet Yes is doing a full cruise and booking it. Which I read about in the book, yeah. Right. Yeah. So do you think that had anything to do with its temporary, that it wasn't really girl-oriented? Yeah. And, um, you know, that kind of thing. The, the not, not kind of science fiction The not so, being able to dance to it, I think, is a bigger factor. Although, uh, again, in the 60s, these are the bands playing the all-night... Uh, acid right. test freakouts. Right. I mean, in, in in this country, it's a Grateful Dead. In that country, yes. it's Soft Machine and Yes right. that are playing these shows. So that is not quite dancing <laughs> when you're really well, high on right, acid right, and gyrating. Right. That's true. And the nice lose their guitarist because he does too much acid and dances right. too much, but while they're supposed to be performing. Um, so I think that's a factor. I mean, a lot of rock music is just is is complete is complete tight tight pants male, and the, these guys are no exception. Right. There are I think actually proportionately in the big hit bands, more female vocalists in, in Curved Air and in Renaissance. Uh, but like all this, basically guitar solo, the guitar, anything that had a culture guitar solo seems to have gone more male focused. Uh, on the only th- note I'll add on the dancing is that as sort of for the end, at the end of the book, I was trying to see where this music ended up and a lot of it does get sampled for hip hop. Uh, De La Soul find really good, yes, uh, keyboard John Anderson licks and Kanye West finds not just uh, King Crimson, but finds in a Mike Oldfield song that had been a single but had been forgotten uh, it because I think the music is so spacey and unique it survives more than you know the kind of 
it took like the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack to bring back some generic riff rock. This right. was so much weirder that I it, it right. got a second life in a there's a pretty big weird culture in rap and that I've seen them grab this um, in a more you know, grab, grab with both hands where some rock bands were kind of tentatively using it as an influence. Thanks. To, yeah. to be to be fair to um, prog rock, it's it's not common for a, a, a new genre of music to last beyond six seven years. You yeah. think about the right. British invasion bands. You've got you got the Who, you got the Kinks, you've got these these bands that go on to a lot of career, the longer career. But a lot of the bands mm -hmm. and the movements crack up, and bands like the Who really change, you mm -hmm. know, over over the course. They're not the the Who of '67, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, maybe prog rock just ran the normal course of most pop music trends. Yeah, it's it's at its height for eight years, which is longer than I, I lived through rap rock and. The scars never never heal, <laughs> and that was that only was about eighteen months. Yeah. How about the time we went to the Kid Rock show together? <laughs> For the the, the slate Mike. retreat, at the Kid Rock show. Yeah. yeah. Insofar as you probably are the only Venn diagram between prog rock and Politico Mediatric Washington. Yeah. I wonder which figures in Washington remind you of which figures in prog rock. Oh man, that's the second one. I prepare <laughs> these. The second. Uh, the second of these very exploratory questions, I, I, mean, I see Greg Lakes everywhere because <laughs> the, per, the the guy who has uh, a personality and one thing he can do, but vastly overrates uh, how far that should take him, and that's Keith Emerson's pretty brutal sometimes about how there are two virtuosos in the band, and there's Greg Lake who's pretty good at bass singing, and once equal footing and a expensive rug to stand on. So I see there are members of Congress that remind me of that personality. There, I wish there were more Robert Fripps who actually were inventive thinkers. And there are, uh, well, there are lots of white men too. So that that scans pretty well. That's a good Venn diagram between the between the two these musics. No, but actually writing the book was a huge refuge from the campaign. I mean, people here might have already forgotten there was a presidential campaign <laughs> last year. I forget who won, but uh, <laughs> that. Uh, I definitely, w I started writing this in the early pre-primary season, which obviously begins the day after the previous election, and this, I would have gone nuts had I not been writing this. Probably did anyway, but I would have gone, uh, going back to this and realizing that there's more to life than not the polling and the spin and the being offended by things that aren't that offensive, uh, that was very helpful for my, for my sanity, and I don't know how I'm going to do it for the next three years. Well, yeah, I'm maybe glad I should write the rap rock book. Maybe that would fix it. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you had that refuge because it's really yeah. a fine book. Oh, thank you. You won't get these political questions anywhere else. I didn't. City. No, in yeah. even even in Texas, yeah. I thought they'd have something. But <laughs> it's only in DC. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Hi, Jack. Hey. Um, so I guess we all know the conventional wisdom that uh, the punk and new wave movements were seen as the anti-prog rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Buggles were in Yes, yeah. and Robert Fripp played with the Talking Heads and Blondie, and mm -hmm. I think Nick Mason produced a, an album by The Damned. Yeah. So the impression I get is that maybe the anti-prog sentiment wasn't as widespread among the actual musicians in Hogan Wave, and it was, it was more rock critic hype. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, it was pretty performative, and it was more critics than the musicians. Uh, I mean, the germs are about as, as anti-technique as you can get, and mm -hmm. they quote Roundabout and one of their songs, uh, and No God, on their one album, uh, and, and David Allen from Gong, who I think is probably competes with John Anderson in terms of the most spacey out there hmm. of all these guys, makes a No Wave album, but <laughs> collaborating yeah. with New York musicians, they were like, oh, yeah, of course, this is this is great, and yeah, a lot more cross pollination with the actual musicians, uh, and even. Uh, the, the 80s music press seems to be a little more forgiving. <laughs> I mean, mm. Robert Fripp, I found, was this, was this presence zooming in and out and giving his blessing to Joe Strummer and these other, other whatever right. was interesting. He, but but uh, he's respected. I think it's more the arena rock culture that everyone rejects. The music itself, definitely. Yeah. They, the actual musicians who respect the technique, you're right, respect it more than the critics did. There's a bit of... Um prog rock influence on John Lydon's second band, yeah. Public Image Limited. It's well, it's yeah. experimental. It's mm -hmm. I mean, you could almost imagine, um, you know, Fripp behind the scenes pulling some strings. Yeah, and he, he shares a basis with that David going, uh, sorry, David Allen uh, New Wave project I, I was talking about. So they interesting music kind of has a way, uh, like Dinosaur DNA, of, of <laughs> life finds a way. Uh, that's, that's what I found with... Uh, 
that was a fun part of the book to research too. All the stuff I, the the breadcrumbs dropped through the eighties. I didn't realize yeah. were there. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yes, sir. So earlier you had talked about in the court of the Crimson King sort of being ground zero for progressive yeah. rock, and that's you're not the first person to say that. As a lot of critics mm -hmm. that sort of point to that album is that. And my question is. Why did the early albums of Frank Zappa not get listed oh, yeah. as the start of progressive rock? Something like We're Only In It For The Money, which came out a year earlier. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good question. It, I kind of went, I mentioned with uh, talking to fans and trying to get, I guess, a human version of a Spotify algorithm for what this music was. And it came down to progressive rock was very English uh, because it was people who didn't hear American influenced music, especially black American music, until much later, and we're starting out with like, Anglican church songs and stuff. I went, I definitely stayed within that frame. Frank Zappa appears in the book because I, I mean, especially he, a bigger role when Adrian Ballou shows up uh, and he gives him, I think, his due as a composer who taught other people how to compose. But that's kind of the only reason why. Uh, I think there are, there are family trees, uh, Cro Magnon, sort of Neanderthal family trees, or Homo sapiens sapiens, <laughs> where um, it's the San Francisco scene and Frank Zappa's totally just totally unique, almost outsider art. They're they're on one tree and grass rocks on other, but very close. They're very close branches. But yeah, I um, that's ba it was basically a choice. I don't have a lot of kraut rock in the book either, for the reason that it was already it was written about. It wasn't. I was trying to elevate some stuff that had not gotten its due. I thought, and Frank Zappa happily mostly gets his due. But it's the main reasons. Just this starts with British musicians, and I didn't contradict. I mean, I'd love it if somebody wrote the uh, the anti this the way like Dick Morris used to write a book with like the cover, or whatever book Bill Clinton just wrote. If someone in, <laughs> probably Jack wants to write the <laughs> the answer to this and start with Zappa, then I'm all for it. The revi all prog rock, the revisionist view, the real story. But one Thank man's you. story. Thank you. I'm a big fan of Rush. Uh, yeah. First saw them in 1976. They played all of side one of 2112. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so where do you see Rush in the pantheon of prog rock? Oh, they're in, they're in the book, and they get a big role for the what, the the bands that grow up hearing the the first wave of progressive rock musicians. There's kind of a an in between generation. Rush are the one that uh, one want to succeed what Yes is doing. They actually want to record in England for the reason that they're so influenced by progressive music. Uh, and they're also elevated by in this really short window and the British rock press is still res still respectful of progressive rock and interested in what, what's coming. Uh, so so they're, there, they're there. I mean, I, I, I try not to divide it too much into, cause into, year, uh, to, into year by year genres. It's a little more free-flowing. But they're that. They're the first really important band that's influenced by progressive rock and proud of the influence yeah do you think clockwork angels was a return to progressive and they oh, yeah. played the entire well, thing a, in, in the concert it's a concept album and that's a i think i basically the recent rock tours have kind of ruined my the old frame where if a band played the entire album in concert usually it was a progressive rock band now it's i think you two are playing uh the whole joshua tree just it's a way to sell tickets now <laughs> but if you write a piece of music that you're going to have the audience listen to in one go uh, up until recently. I think that was progressive, and that is that is how my favorite Yes stories in the book come about because they write a 80-minute album on two LPs and play it in its entirety for as long as the fans can stand uh, and as far as as long as w w Wakeman can stand it, which is not very long. So, yeah, Clockwork Angels and with an accompanying novel and everything. I mean, they went really far with that, yeah. Um, Prog Rock is very rarely... It's got very few women in it, mm -hmm. and it's got very few blacks, African Americans, or uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, w why do you think that is? Because yeah. because it's it's hard is British and male. Oh yeah, I think that's that's basically it. That's that is the pool that's drawn from the generation that's right the first of this music. Uh, that there, it's a mostly white country uh, with a very male scene, the bands playing for sock hops and college tours and things like that. Uh, progressive rock in the 80s and then progressive metal in the 90s corrects some of that. I've seen a lot more diversity in progressive metal, which kind of ends the book because uh, Steve Wilson from Porky Bentry argues, and I agree, that that's the last new thing. That's not just bands trying to sound like yes because they like yes. That is bands taking another form and, and, and bending it 
out of shape. And so you, I, I mean, I've seen a ton of, of female and non-white dudes in, in progressive, especially more than the average metal band. I see it a lot. Uh, and also the music picks up really big. It, it has a, sur- it survives in Japan in a way. Some of some American things like Tower Records survive in Japan when they're when they're lost here, uh, to the extent where Japan briefly had a wax, a wax dis- uh, not a full display, but a, not a full museum, but a display of wax uh, models, including Robert Fripp, a little <laughs> on the one one tower in Tokyo. And when I went there last year, it was very sad to see it had been replaced by something much more boring. Uh, most things be more boring than a wax Robert Fripp statue, <laughs> but the following these bands get in. Asia and South America ends up creating another wave of, 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 of uh, not just fans, but bands like this, and those are more diverse. But the first wave, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, a lot of rock history ends up being super white. A lot uh, of, uh, lots of Western history ends up being super white. Another being super reason white. I turned against prog rock is every time I took a girlfriend to a prog rock show, she would dump me. <laughs> for, she for, said, for Greg she said, Lake. No, yeah. no, she would just say, yeah. and this was long before Love Beach and the, <laughs> and, and the hot, you know, the, the, the hot chest hair thing. No, they they would go and they'd say, if you like this shit, I don't, <laughs> I don't want anything to do with you. A um, uh, couple more minutes, good for another question. Uh, if anybody wants to bring one to the microphone. Hi, as a British woman, yes. I can <laughs> honestly say this is... Um, you know, this sort of music is just bread and butter to me. I mean, yeah, I just yeah. think it's fantastic. Anyone who says it's no good has no taste. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not the first time. Not brilliant. the first time that's been observed. <laughs> actually, actually, Jack, this is an intervention. I came to tell you. That. I mean, you've got to be able to play air guitar and yeah. head bang, and, and yeah, it's yeah. a great time, right? And some of the best albums. Like, I mean, uh, you're talking of Japan. Mm-hmm. I think one of the best live albums ever was made in Japan by Deep Purple. Right. Yeah. What do you think? I I agree with that. It's actually the Luckily, uh, King Crimson, to come back, I keep coming back to them, uh, have figured out that a lot of their live shows are good and keep releasing them because I don't think there was a perfect uh, progressive rock live album until very recently. People were going to the decks to find other stuff. For some weird re- reason, the first progressive live albums are just kind of, well, with the exception of Yes Songs, kind of uh, what was recorded uh, not, not in not very great quality off, off the decks. But yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic, that, that record. And Deep Purple are right on the outskirts. Uh, there's, a, there's a metal... Yes progressive Venn diagram um, it, as long as there's a big organ in it. I mean, Black right. Sabbath being the John one Lord. that are the most, well, John Lord and then Black Sabbath yeah. uh, with Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath kind of cross-pollinating just for one album. But right. no, the fan base I, I found was more diverse than the musicians. But that's, I mean, when you do a pantheon of anything in rock, I think it ends up being white guys for a pretty long time. Yeah, yeah. And you're right with respect to uh, the bands themselves, mainly white guys, right? Yeah. Uh, your Eye Heap, what was your impression of your Eye Heap? Oh, Heart? yeah, they're, they're again, they're in, they're, in the, yeah. they're in that zone. Uh, yeah. They're promoted. I mean, uh, going back to the all, the 70s coverage of these of these bands, and uh, I read, I th- read and skimmed every British rock magazine that uh, that exists over the course of a couple of years and they were in the same breath they were promoted the same way mm-hmm. they're on the same bills uh so progressive was defined i mean defined pretty big and i think people didn't mind being included in it so you had uriah heap and um you have hawk window also in it and right. in terms of the stage show pretty influential but veer a little bit towards metal and then their fans make make uh, a transition to straight at metal in a pretty swift way right okay yeah. uh, well thanks a lot got, yeah, thank one, you. got one more question here how are you doing? I, doing? I heard something very original is that you had a, a, a link with collector culture and the prog rock. That yeah. that was uh, something I haven't considered before, but do you think there's something, a genre or maybe uh, yeah. an art form where the collectors are, you know, um, staying, uh, other than stamps and coins or, or something like that, is there something that has sort of replaced that hunger they have for, you know, the nitty gritty and the detail and the... Oh, I don't know. I just, link? it stuck out with progressive rock because the fans were so intense about something that was so discarded that it, it actually plays a big role in keeping it going uh, to the extent where I, I give Marillion credit for basically inventing Kickstarter 10 years before Kickstarter because labels don't know what the hell to do with them and online they just say well if enough people agree to buy an album which we will imaginatively, imaginatively uh, end up naming Marillion.com mm-hmm. uh, then we're going to make it and it works and then Marillion take that to doing well we're, if enough people want to go to a uh, festival every couple of years. We'll have a weekend, and they do that, and it succeeds. Uh, so that's why I think this has survived. And even while I was writing the book, it felt like it was coming back. Progressive rock, I mean, a little bit in esteem, just because once you have the uh, the vast terrain of the internet, and anyone 
able to find something new, anyone able to find a fellow obsessive, uh, that keeps it going in a way that some music that was cooler for five seconds, maybe there are a couple of fans online, but it's not rewarded the same way. Okay, thanks, Ryan. All right, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, I wonder why you're focusing on ELP and Yes, who were brilliant bands, yeah. but there was so much more. Like, you didn't mention Cream. Oh, but there's a ton in the book, actually. Oh, That's I, a great. I've got to buy the book. Wait, can we, end on, we can end on that, actually. <laughs> well, it's a you fine item on all Clapton of them. or I don't know where you'd put Led Zeppelin. Uh, in a, or, uh, they're, they're in. Uh, the narrative kind of starts with, well, first some, some classical music and uh, that ends up undergirding a lot of this. Then with the British rock scenes where that comes into play, then explains what diverges and why. But that's in there, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch we didn't mention. Uh, so I think we would have had more quizzical expressions, fewer head nods. We want as many head nods as possible. Uh, but a, lot, a ton of the book, if, if, if you read it like that. I want to be comprehensive without just being like a listicle or a bunch of, here are the best 500 things. I want to tell a story, but put these bands in a role that they often get cut out of. Yeah, so thanks. By the way, this music is the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you insult it? <laughs> I listen to it all the time. Disp <laughs> disparagement is my job description. <laughs> um, I've got two final questions, and then we'll call it a wrap, and you can buy Dave's book and come here, get him to sign it, and stab it with a dagger if you brought a dagger. Uh, my first question is, if anybody's driving to Arlington and wants to give me a lift, raise your hand, because I need one. Okay? And uh, the, uh, the, the last question is, and we didn't really get into this, um, it's a, it's a hopelessly utopian yeah. uh, musical genre. We really haven't talked about that. It's 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 sort of utopian and and, it, and it's th there's there's a dystopian sometimes mm -hmm. edge to it. But it's it's this dreamy, um, otherworldly conjuring of of uh, uh, other universes and not a lot of psych psychedelics behind it. It's mm -hmm. coming. It's 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 no, it it's a literary it's, it's a literary wrong. William Blakeian. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, creative explosion, and I just you know that I think that that's that that uh, when you're trying to do the taxonomy of the bands, mm -hmm. um, that's the, to me is often done the unifying um, aspect of the, of the music, and I'd like to talk about that. Well, and uh, then and then we'll and then we'll say go. Goodnight. Well, that's probably one reason why it's it gets left out a little bit because yeah, the the to the extent there's a politics, it's pretty in, environmentalist and utopian and and one world in a way that things were in this window in the late 60s and 1970s and then aren't anymore. That's <laughs> just not as accepted. Uh, or it's shoved off in the back of a festival somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's the thing I, I liked about it. The band, uh, there's also an archness about some of the bands as they wrote this music, especially as, as they wrote something that seemed very spacey and, and dippy. They knew what they were doing. Some of the, some of the lyrics, and Ian Anderson is writing lyrics for Jethro Atoll knowing that it's fun to play with the critics who want to find great meaning <laughs> and philosophy behind what's basically a rock song. So that, but that's what I wanted to write through the book is that this music which gets so pigeonholed was at its time incredibly radical and deserved credit for being that way. And that's, uh, and then I wonder if I could rewind to the guy I just told to buy the book. What's a, what's a good way to tell people to buy the book on the way out? Buy the book. Buy the book. All right. Round of applause for the man. Thank you. He did a great job. Thank you. It's a, it's a fine book.